Welcome to Hopkins on the Hill. Welcome to Hopkins on the Hill at home. Hi, I'm Congressman Kwaisi Mfume, representing Maryland's 7th Congressional District. As a proud alumnus of Johns Hopkins University and a former member of the Board of Trustees, I fully understand the importance and the impact Hopkins does both on and off the Hill. Right now, more than 16,000 district residents are employed by Hopkins, and almost 2,000 district residents are enrolled at one of the campuses. Federal investments not only bring jobs and opportunities into our communities, the funding also supports research and essential services. For instance, Vision for Baltimore partners with Baltimore City Schools to offer eye exams, glasses, and other things to students who need them. And the Tuned In program at Peabody provides Baltimore City Public School students with a Peabody prep education for free, and it has an extremely high rate of high school completion. I could go on and on about all of the ways federal investments help residents in the 7th District, but suffice it to say that I am truly grateful for all the great things happening at each of the Johns Hopkins campuses. Your work is not only important to the 7th Congressional District, but to our great state and nation. Thank you for all that you do. Ah, being a nurse is challenging in all of the best ways. Nurses are in every aspect of the health system and in systems people don't think of as the health system. You can work with people one-on-one, -on -one, you can work with whole populations, you can work with policymakers. It's a platform to just about anything. I just think it's the best career. So I'm very interested in older adults and what we can do as a society to help them stay as healthy as possible as they age and to age with as many options as possible. The more we're independent, the more we can um, feel that we are as we've been our whole lives. It's toxic psychologically not to be independent. So we developed Capable with colleagues and built it on the ABLE program, which was developed by Laura Gitlin. It's a nurse, an occupational therapist, and a handyman for a time-limited period. It's four months. I develop research so that the outcomes of the research are directly relevant to people who make decisions about health care and health policy. What we've measured in Capable is not only what matters to people and whether they're improving, but also health care costs. We have so many older adults and we're getting more and more as the demographic shift happens. We need to be able to test affordable programs that end up saving money for the whole society. I am Dr. Sarah Zanton and I am a nurse. We got this. Welcome to Hopkins on the Hill. A very special thanks to Maryland's 7th Congressional District Representative, Congressman Kwaise Mfume. So today, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Sarah Zanton, who is a thought leader and researcher investigating how we can best support people as they age in their homes and in their communities. Dr. Zanton co-developed the CAPABLE program that provides support needed for adults to successfully age while maintaining their independence and their engagement with their communities. Dr. Zant and Sarah, welcome, glad to have you. I'm so happy to be here with you. So many of us have been very fortunate to watch our loved ones age, and it does create an awareness at the, of the importance of keeping that individual really at the center of this process, their dignity, their comfort, their independence. 
how does Capable provide support for older adults who really wish to live in their homes and in their communities as they age? Thank you. So just as all children should start with an equal chance to thrive, all older adults should be able to age with dignity and as much independence as possible. And they should be in charge of what that means. Uh, we often tend to tell people you should get rid of something, you know, that throw rug as, as a nervous child of an older adult. But uh, we've shown capable, it's time limited service, it's four months. It's a handy worker, an occupational therapist, and a nurse as a team. And they work together with the older adult in charge to provide visits in their home and to work with the older adult and their home to make both stronger and more resilient so that older adults have what they need for to maintain independence. So, so it's a team of three, right? Handyman, the, the occupational therapist, the nurse, and it's really encompassing both the individual, but really their environment, their, their home environment. Can you give a few more specific examples of how improving the health and safety of adults who are aging in their communities actually occurs? Like, what does, what does that Absolutely. mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, you hear a lot these days about person-centered care or patient-centered care, but a lot of times that is trying to help people get to the goals that medical professionals have for them, like their blood pressure in control, or they should lose weight, or they, the diabetes should be in control. But in true person-centered care, it's around what the goals the person has. They may be more motivated to play with their grandchildren than to lose 10 pounds, but maybe they would do it through the same way. So um, I'll give you an example. We had a, a capable participant who was a veteran. He had been in the Vietnam War. And when we got to him, he was in terrible pain. He was on dialysis, um, which meant that he took a shuttle bus uh, three times a week to a dialysis center for four hours at a time. That was the only time he left his house. He moved around his house in a wheelchair. Um, his expression was completely um, blank. We would call it a flat affect. Um, and he uh, could, the only way he could get outside out his back door was if his grandson who didn't live with him could lift him out back. And if, as a nurse practitioner, if I had seen him in a clinic, he had come into his wheelchair in that much pain with a kind of a blank face, I probably would have just looked at his prescriptions, looked at his chronic conditions and prescribed what he needed, maybe some blood work and he's out the door. But when you're in someone's home, and you're completely oriented to what they need and what matters to them. We, he ended up deciding that his goals were to be able to shave standing up um, rather than having it all dribble down into his lap um, and to get at the back door on his own to be able to listen to the birds uh, and to be in less pain. He didn't mention his depression and we didn't mention either because that was not his goals. And um, it, through Capable, the nurse worked with him on his pain. The occupational therapist worked with him on ways to um, be able to shave more simply, more, easy, more easily. And we put grab bars around the sink and grab bars around the back door. And his, the nurse worked with him on leg strength. And through all of those, he had many changes. But the biggest ones for him was he could stand, he could shave standing up, which was a dignity matter to him. And he could come and go out of his back door rather than waiting for someone to pick him up. And after capable, he was going out into the community besides dialysis. So that's an example of, you wouldn't walk into someone's house and say, you need to be able to get this out the back door. But he decided that, through, and that's true person-centered care and an example of how function is part of health equity. Wow, so I think the other amazing part of that story you just told was, then he started to go out into the community and other times other than just to and from dialysis for four hours. So it has this kind of almost like a tipping point effect in, in a good yeah. way, right? So it really, and, go ahead. And he had a sparkle in his eyes by the end of it too. And he, it was, and the other thing about capable, sometimes people hear it and they think grab bars. And there are grab bars, plenty of grab bars in capable. But really what it is, is an engine for self-efficacy, an engine for being able to accomplish new goals. And one of the things about aging, even though we all do it, if we're lucky, um, we don't realize how much adaptation is part of it. Older adults adapt as much as toddlers are adapting. It's, it, there's as much developmental change, um, but we give so much less support. There aren't people around advising and supporting. And so many people who've been incapable tell us 
Nobody trains you to get old. You learn how to do a trade. You learn how to make, um, you know, compromise with people on teams and stuff, but you, nobody trains you how to adapt. And so that's part of what Capable does is it's not just the, um, the environmental changes and the working on the pain and depression. It's also a mindset around problem solving that then has lasting effects. So you said it's about achieving self-efficacy. What is that and why is that important to human health? Yes, yeah, sorry, I was speaking research speak. Um, so self-efficacy is important because it's a, um, it builds on itself where one gets confidence to face future challenges. And none of us know what's coming down the pike. None of us know, you know, that there's gonna be a death of a best friend or, you know, trauma. But if we can build people's ability to problem solve and know that they can do it and know how to reach out for resources, you don't have to get at this. You don't have to anticipate each specific problem. You can help them think through, oh, maybe I should call the doctor or I'm about to be out of this refill, maybe I should do this, or I've lost this person who used to give me advice, who else might be able to give me advice? So it really does build. It sets up uh, an individual to continue to make these adaptations, but kind of within their own framework and on their own terms so that those additional um, challenges that come up later in life are things that can be addressed. That's just an amazing story. And I imagine, for policy and program decision makers, as you pointed to in, in the video, that these stories are very compelling. But you also noted that you select outcomes in your research that are important for policy and program decision makers. So let's just take one step back and says, and let me ask you this question. What built your awareness about the need for outcomes like this that are kind of ready for policy and program decision makers to use for decision making? Um, well, I was a lobbyist before I was a nurse. I actually fell in love with nursing because I took nurses and nurse practitioners around Capitol Hill to talk to staffers and um, trained them, you know, with one pagers and <laughs> talking points um, and started volunteering at a clinic more to know what I was talking about than because I thought I wanted to be a nurse. But I really fell in love with that one-on-one -on -one rapport that one gets um, working as a nurse with, uh, with a, a patient. I also would say that um, I'm just a very common sense person. I mean, I'm, I'm a pointy-headed academic in some ways, but um, to me, if, if a policymaker is going to be deciding whether to advance a program to reach more people, they're going to want to know how much it costs and how much it saves. And it shouldn't have to save money. We don't require heart surgery to save money or medications to save money. Medications just have a pathway through FDA. And if they're approved, they can be paid for. But I, I just thought from a practical matter, we need to know exactly how much these visits cost, how much is going parts and labor into people's homes and for what. Um, and then are we averting nursing home admissions? Are we averting hospitalizations? And to capture that, I figured was really important so that you could just look from a balance sheet perspective. You're spending this much, how much are you saving and who's saving it? So those are kind of the, the um, maybe economic based kind of uh, outcomes that, of, of course, policy and program decision makers are, are absolutely need. Are there other outcomes that you look at in your research that are, are meaningful to understanding kind of the, the reach of the research, research or the program in the person's life? Yes, absolutely. And of course, that's the most important. Um, so we, in geriatrics, there are um, things called ADLs, activities of daily living. Those are the things that we've all on this call done today. We've showered, we've brushed our teeth, we might have combed our hair, maybe not. Uh, we've gotten dressed. All of those things that are key to um, being able to take care of oneself. And um, if one can't do these activities of daily living, one's at a much higher risk of going to a nursing home. It only makes sense, right? If you can't get dressed, if you can't bathe, um, that's not sustainable. So these activities of daily living have been measured the same way uh, with, with excellent uh, clinically relevant results since the 1970s. Um, and they are about how difficult is it for you to bathe, to dress, to groom, 
um, to eat. Um, and then there's a whole other category called instrumental activities of daily living, which are things like getting groceries into the house, um, managing your medications, managing your finances. So those are kind of one layer up. You don't have to do those yourself, but nobody wants to be bathed by somebody else. Nobody wants to be dressed by somebody else. We all don't mind having groceries delivered. We found out this year, but for the activities of daily living. So we ask about difficulty with those um, before and after and uh, before capable, the four months of capable and after. Um, we also uh, ask about depression using the PHQ-9. We ask about pain. Um, and the, the nice thing about the economic cost savings and these activities of daily living is that, you know, we've published a lot of papers about this, but now that there are new capable sites across the country, they can measure with our simpler measures like the activities of daily living and know that they will likely have the same cost savings without having to get Medicare claims and Medicaid claims the way that we did. Interesting. How do, how do people move about as they get older? How do we measure, you know, you talked about activities of daily living. A lot of those things happen in the home. But right. one thing you noted with the story at the beginning of our discussion here was that this individual was in kind of going out into the community and for an individual to age in their home and in their community connected to their community, there must be measurements there that show the value of something like capable. Is, is that yeah. true? Yes, Th thank you. So there's a, there's a concept called life space which is very common sense. It is the patterns of functional mobility over time. It's a holistic measure. In other words, it gathers together a lot of aspects. So for example, one's life space is affected by, can you bathe? Can you get out of the house? Um, can you walk? And so that means it's, it's a holistic or integrated measure. And what it's really interesting because the pioneers who've measured life space have proven that as your life space contracts, you know, as you are less likely to go to another city on a train or less likely to go to the supermarket or each kind of contraction towards your bedroom incrementally makes you more at risk to be put in a nursing home or die. So it's kind of like an early indicator, that contraction. And um, we, we think of it as kind of there's life zones where your bedroom is the anchor and then there's patterns out and capable does improve people's life space, as you mentioned from the story that I told. Um, and um, it also, yeah, another measure we um, look at is something called falls efficacy, which is how confident you can do different things without falling, how confident you can shower without falling, how confident can you um, walk down steps without falling and capable is kind of through the roof in terms of improving people's confidence with that. So at the beginning, we had talked about how individuals um, get more confidence and, and they're reporting all of this to you, right? They're, they're reporting, here are my goals. And, and then as the self-efficacy grows, they're reporting to you that now I'm going out into my community a little bit more. With, with something like life space, is that measured by them reporting to you where they go and how frequently they go there. I mean, I personally think I hear something like that and I immediately think, oh, digital technology. How could this play? I mean, everybody's got, you know, some sort of monitoring device about where they're going or, or to map something about how to get there. Is there any kind of integration of that level of digital technology into these measurements of life space? So um, there are with other researchers, and we are about to start a study that uses Apple Watches to corroborate people's or to give another angle towards their life space. Um, so self-report is kind of the gold standard, because if you think about it, what they feel about how they're doing and what they think they're doing is also important, pot potentially in a different way than what they're actually doing, if those don't match up. But yeah, um, Apple Watches and other, you know, and Fitbits and all can be used to corroborate that. And, and a lot of people are looking at that now. Very interesting. So, so when you designed Capable with kind of this individual, their goal setting, their self-reported at the center, have you found that it has impacts beyond an individual to, to a population level? How do you kind of extrapolate that and measure that and, and show that this program is doing something for not just individuals, but for a large enough number of individuals, it's doing enough to suggest this program is really something that people should pay attention to, namely policy and program decision makers. Right, so if, if you and anybody who's listening thinks about older people in your life, you know, parents, grandparents, favorite teachers, 
uh, presidents, senators, you know, there are a lot of older peoples in our lives. And um, having them be able to be independent and do what they would like uh, matters. Um, and Capable's only served about 2,000 people so far across the country. It started off as research with NIH funding um, and CMMI funding, uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovations funding. And it's had a lot of philanthropy. But what it needs next is for Medicare to cover it. Um, it the Medicare Advantage plans are starting to cover it. And there's a lot of... Um, um, you know, more flexibility and a population health perspective than there used to be. But for it to really scale, for it to really have the population health impact that you're talking about, it will need a way to be paid for. Um, and as I mentioned, there's nothing like the FDA that says, okay, here's your evidence and it's good. And now Medicare should cover it. Um, and so there, there was a PTAC process that we went through that suggested that, um, that, that CMS should scale it. Um, and capable was actually tested through the Affordable Care Act um, authority. And so CMS can actually look at the data and, and scale it based on, on what they already know. Um, but just coming back to the nub of your question, which is that older adults, if you think about, as I was mentioning, the people in your lives, they have so much to give, so much wisdom. And the more, it's like the gentleman that I was mentioning who never left out, um, he could be um, tutoring people, or he could be offering business advice, or, you know, if you think about the older people in your lives who have so much to give, and um, one person that I'll just mention, who before um, we came, he hadn't been able to bathe in a year by himself, he could only kind of stand by the, sit by the bath, I mean, by the sink, and kind of brush himself off, um, and he hadn't been able to get off the couch in that same year. So family members had to pull him up if they wanted to get up and he couldn't cook for himself. He was able to uh, change all of those based on making the couch a little taller and adding some things around the bath and strengthening his legs um, and uh, several other things. But now he, this whole pandemic time, he has been the online Zoom schooler with his grandchildren. So it's really important that we don't think about older adults as just what can we do to keep them in place and to not cost too much. We need to think about older adults as us. Aging is living. We're all going to be old if we're lucky. And so um, what wisdom do we have that we could give back? And so if older adults are our greatest growing natural resource. And so we need to not just think about we're trying to build self-efficacy and independence for their own selves, which is great, but they have so much to give back. So our greatest growing natural resource, I think, is, is even more meaningful now as we're hearing about declines in, in the birth rate uh, associated with, with 2020 in the United States. And, and I, I imagine this you know, greatest growing natural resource is one of the key messages that you convey to policy and program decision makers to essentially get the program so far that there's pilot data and, and Medicaid and Medicare that they can look to see how this program is performing. But I imagine there's still a ways to go to get it to get it fully covered. So what is your message when you talk to policy and program decision makers about capable? What do you want them to focus on? What is your message here? How do you communicate your science? and your goal for individuals to be this growing natural resource in, in the United States, how do, you, how do you convey all of that to someone who's gonna make a decision about whether Medicaid covers this? Well, um, I always try to understand first what they're interested in um, and which part of the government they're with and what kinds of policy levers they are interested in. Um, but from a higher level perspective than a more tactical perspective, um, I think it, capable fits in so many streams of the challenges of our country. Um, and so we are able to, uh, with ethics and dignity, frame it in any of the ways it's true person-centered care. It's a way of improving health equity. Um, I mean, if you think about the structured inequity that there has been by race and class in this country, that older adults who have, um, who African-American older adults, for example, and especially um, women, African-American women are much more likely to be as disabled than any other group. And um, you know, our research has focused at first that the, the, the first trial was 85% African-American women. And we showed, cutting in half their disability. 
So, so from a health equity perspective, capable is a home run. Um, from a person-centered care, it's true person-centered care. Things like making sure everyone has a um, advanced directive, that, that's important too, but there's nothing squishy about capable. It's manualized. We know how to set goals. A, a, a place can just do it, right? It's almost like taking a drug in terms of you, you can just open the box and know how to do capable with our training. So it's person-centered care, it's health equity, it saves money. Um, so it can be um, you know, a small investment now that, that saves money going forward. Um, and um, all of those, all of those with the stories and the data and the framing towards what the person is thinking about, I guess, is how we frame it. Well, I mean, it's it's absolutely wonderful. I, I think it's also very intriguing to me that your background is in nursing. Mm-hmm. So how how is the nurse being a nurse? How has that influenced you and your ability to conduct this type of research with the team that you work with, with this really ultimate goal of improving the lives of older adults? So as the film said at the beginning, I love being a nurse. And um, nursing is really about context, if you think about it. Nursing is about people's cells, their organs, their, their whole body, their families, their communities, their environment. Um, context is kind of our lane. And so having, um, thinking about something with a person in their environment and how their family affects them in their environment is, um, is right up nursing's lane. Plus we understand the depression and the pain and the more physiologic stuff as well. Um, I, to me, nursing science is the science of a meaningful life. Like how, to, how, do, we, um, how do we take away people's barriers uh, towards equity and being able to do what they would like to do. And on a more um, kind of pragmatic or down to earth way that nursing has affected me in this way is I'm a nurse practitioner and I used to provide house calls to um, older adults. Before that, I, I worked with migrant farm workers, some of whom lived in chicken coops. Um, and I worked with um, adults who were homeless. And so I've always really been interested in housing challenges and health and how housing is health. Um, but seeing, providing house calls where what I was initially thinking was what's going to be your blood pressure and how let's check your ankles and what are you eating? But the person arrives on their hands and knees to open the door, or they've got holes all throughout the floor, or they have to drop their keys from the second floor because they can't get down the stairs. You, you arrive there with your clinical set of skills and you realize that that's not what the person's most caring about that day. They want to get dressed. They want to stand. They want to be able to prepare food. So all of this together is, um, I think, how the, the, the nursing lens affected the development of capable, the co-development of capable. I want to say we adapted it from the ABLE program that Laura Gettman developed. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Sarah. I mean, this has been a wonderful program to learn about the philosophy, the academic behind it, but also just the common sense of what this program does and how it can be cost savings to prevent future um, additional morbidity and mortality, but really also just to give people what they need to age connected to their communities um, in a way that, as you said, it's it's total common sense. Um, so I just was wondering if you would stick around for just a few minutes for some questions from the audience. Sure. Yes. Okay. okay, so Hopkins on the Hill audience at home, if you have questions for our guest, Dr. Sarah Zanton, please do submit them now and let me scroll down to where I can see these questions. Okay, so first, how do you recruit the caregivers for capable? For example, like how do you contract a handy person? I mean, maybe that's the first question because the handy person is kind of, the handy worker is outside of the kind of the realm of, of health and wellness, right? The, the occupational worker and the nurse, I can see how you can set up those contracts, with, but like at, at the, how, how are you doing this? Well, so that's a great question. And you're right. Usually those are very different organizations. I'm going to give a quick shout out to Civic Works in Baltimore, Maryland, that has been our partner for 11 years being the handy worker. And they were really good about getting us to change from handyman to handy worker because a lot of their people are women. Um, and um, so there are places like Civic Works across the country that are AmeriCorps training sites. So AmeriCorps is a federal program that's wonderful that helps people with job training. And so uh, with Civic Works, when, when an experienced contractor and an apprentice go out together, and, um, and so the apprentice is getting training, and often 
they're getting really interesting advice from the older adult. And it's a really nice intergenerational uh, exchange too, where the older adult may say, you really need to fix your teeth or you need to learn fractions so you can do that. Um, and, uh, and the younger adult realizes, oh my goodness, I didn't know older adults had to live like this sometimes. And so that has been fantastic. Most cities have a program that would be like Civic Works. Um, there are, and, and some capable sites have just straight out um, hired a handy person to work on their team. That, that's amazing because you're just adding additional value, right? This is a, mm -hmm. another federally funded program. There's training going on there. There you know, are three people in this, in this environment, the older adult, the the trainee, the, the more senior um, tradesperson who's saying, hey, do it like this, you know, let's, let's think through that. It, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing to be able to incorporate all of that. Next question, how does this model apply to those with cognitive decline who live alone? That is a great question. We are currently adapting capable for people with cognitive decline. If, if you think about how I described it, uh, in its kind of classic form, it takes a lot of problem solving and brainstorming and action planning and setting goals, which can be harder when, if we have cognitive decline. And so we are currently, we have another, we have federal money from NIDLR, which is National Institute of Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research um, to adapt capable for people with cognitive decline. So stay tuned. <laughs> That, that was a hugely insightful question. Thank you for that question from our audience from, I believe it's from Margarita. Thank you very much. Um, and from Jennifer, where, were there any large changes you made during the development of Capable from an unexpected lesson learned? Oh, what a great question. Um, yes, um, this was in the very beginning in the pilot and this is why it's good to pilot things um, before you spread it. Um, when we first started Capable, we thought that the safety needs should come first and then the people's goals. And we found, because that's kind of our mindset as a country, like older adults don't know what they're doing. We have to tell them to move their, their rugs or, um, and so unfortunately we were still a little bit, I would say, infected by that mindset. And so when we did the work order with the older adult for the handy person, we would put kind of our priorities first, like you need to do this and this and this. And within a few participants, we realized, no, 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 it needs to be their priorities. It's their house, it's their life. And just even from a practical perspective, if you make a change in someone's home that they didn't want and they're looking at it 24 seven, that they get mad, they call the dean. <laughs> so <laughs> pretty quickly that um, the, or the priority order should be what the older adult cares about. And we can say, I'm worried a friend of yours might trip on that rug and maybe we could tape it down, but that's very different than saying we need to get rid of the, that rug. That, that's amazing. And, and you're right. If, if there isn't the buy-in for even one of those changes from the person right. who has to look at it 24 seven, that change right. is gonna last where it's gonna create some um, and the flip side, if I can just add, is that the, the, um, the things that are there that they wanted also act as environmental cues to keep doing the good changes that they wanted. So, for example, we've had a number of people who fall in the night when they get up to go to the bathroom. That's a very con and it's a dangerous place to fall is, is in the middle of the night. When you and so for many people, we get them a chair, I mean, a bed rail where it uh, goes on the side of their bed they can hold on to. And we teach them about putting their legs over the side and sitting there for 30 seconds before they stand up. Well, that bed rail is a visual reminder. Oh, I need to sit here for 30, right? And if, if they didn't want that bed rail, they'd be mad at us every time they woke up. <laughs> but because they wanted it and it's a solution to their problem, they're both grateful to capable and they remember, oh, I need to sit here for a minute. So the, the, the environmental changes are a big part, not just of helping them, but also reminding them about what they wanted to do. And all of this building towards that self-efficacy, and it, it brings this question in from Lori, how do you convince weak older adults that they will feel better or be more independent if they don't feel confident about that? We don't do any convincing. I guess that's the biggest answer to that. It, the assessments are all about what would you like to do? What would, if you, if you had a good day here in this home, what would it be? What would you like it to be? What are some favorite activities you used to do that you don't do anymore? It's all around 
what's best for you? What would you like? There's no convincing. And I'll just give a quick example. We had someone who had roaches falling from the ceiling in his kitchen and his um, bedroom was almost impossible to get through uh, with boxes. It was kind of a hoarding situation. And the nurse who went in thought, we've got to get rid of those roaches. But she knew that probably many people said that to him before, and that would seem very um, judgmental. And so she just went with his goals, which had to do with organizing the bedroom first. And then when they finished that, he said, I think I'm ready to tackle the kitchen, but we hadn't said a word about the kitchen. So there's no convincing. There's no telling people to stop smoking. It's all about building their efficacy on the goals that they chose. And then that leads to others. Right. That, that was that kind of, in the first story, the, the spiral of this, right? The spiral upward of, right. of once you're shaving and, and you're getting right. out of the house more, you start getting out of the house more than just right. for dialysis when you can go out your back door. Amazing. Um, from Jeanette, what adaptations need to be made to implement capable in rural versus urban settings? Great question. So um, basically the drive time is longer. Um, and so if uh, places, so places are implementing it in rural settings. In fact, one of our, one of the best capable sites is just four people at a habitat in humanity in rural Minnesota. Um, but um, so the drive time is a little longer. So the, a place might need to budget a little bit more for the nurse and the OT's time. Some of the visits can be through Zoom or through phone in the middle of the four months. There's, there's six, I never got to the specifics. There's six occupational therapy visits and four nurse visits. And so um, we don't really allow that the first or the last visit be just on the phone or by a computer, but some of the middle visits can be. Those visits, people are action planning and brainstorming about their goals. And once you already have the rapport and you've seen the house, you can do those by technology. But I, I just want to close with that by saying, I was talking to someone in a very rural area and I was concerned he was going to think the drive times were too long. And he said, listen, if you save me one helicopter ride for someone to get to a hospital that's 100 miles away, it will have paid for capable for multiple people. So don't worry about the driving. And I will also say this as someone who came from a very rural area. Um, I, you know, I, I drive to Iowa once a year, right? Twice a year sometimes. I mean, they're, they're, drive times are relative. Right. <laughs> <Exactly. Half laughs> and how, and how you kind of perceive yeah. them. Yeah. Um, so another question here it, that I think I'm going to tie two of them together because I think this is important. The first one is from Cheryl. How does one become eligible for the capable program? Is it ability or age based? And then from Mike, this program seems to be focused on people who have significant problems. Is there a bridge for those who are 80 plus and still healthy? So again, this question of age, ability, what, what makes you eligible? Right. So, um, you know, we're hoping that Medicare will pay for this. And if that's the case, then it would be the Medicare age, which would be 65. Um, current, we started with 65 and up, but some of the capable sites, um, we're not in charge of the other capable sites. We just help them with advice and training. So some of the other capable sites, there's 35 around the country now. Um, some of them go down to age 50. Um, and you just have to have some difficulty with any activity of daily living. So if you're to be eligible for those. So if it's a little bit difficult to um, to walk across a small room or to get in the bathtub, um, that counts. But we've had all the way up to people who couldn't do any of them, you know, who were dependent for all of those. So it's a pretty wide uh, range. On average, people have difficulty with four activities of daily living. So four things like dressing or bathing. But amazing that it's still the, the kind of qualifying criteria is again that self reported mm -hmm. activity for daily living, right? So it's still even the eligibility criteria is focused on yeah. the individual. Interesting. Yeah. Um, how can we fund projects like Capable that help the elderly population age at home? You had noted your drive, your kind of continued push for Medicare to fund this program so it would be available for 65 and, and above. Um, are there other ways this could be funded or other other avenues you think that that could be like what are what are these capable sites? How are they funding it if they're they're serving individuals below 65? Right. Um, so that's a couple of questions. So let me see if I can get them. Um, in terms of sustainability, um, you know, I think there needs to be a market and potentially a policy. 
And um, so right now, I, I know you said about the below 65, but um, I'll just answer. Medicare Advantage covers about a third of older adults currently, and will probably um, include about two thirds of them before too long. Medicare Advantage already can offer capable. They just have to um, tell CMS it must be part of their bid and they can do that. Um, for going down to 50, so, so one of the programs that does is um, paid for by a, um, program here in Maryland where the hospitals gather together and already have a, what's called a global budget. And then they try to prevent hospitalizations in the next year. Um, and so Johns Hopkins Hospital actually pays for capable in the community to help the community be more independent and autonomous, but also to avert hospitalizations. So um, just for listeners, there's something called the wrong pocket problem where um, a place that starts, so let's say you're a Habitat for Humanity or you are Meals on Wheels, you might not have money to pay for a nurse, an occupational therapist, and, and a handy worker, um, but um, the local hospital might, or the nursing home might. And if you get together or Medicaid, you know, then, then you can get the pocket that will save the money to pay for the pocket that's gonna lay out the money. And, and just one other thing right now, um, HHS released um, guidance for a 10% um, match in the um, Medicaid rate for states, um, specifically for home and community-based services. And so right now in every single state, they have an opportunity to get 10% more of their money that they can use on things like capable. And they just have to get a, uh, a plan in and it can be a, a, a drafty plan by June 13th. So uh, Medicaid across in all the states could also be paying for capable. That's amazing. And I like how you just also acknowledge these, these different ways if, if, if it isn't covered by Medicare or whatever in your state right now, Medicaid in your state right now, different ways that, that people can think through um, this wrong pocket problem and, and seeking out other resources in their community, um, which really, I think it just goes to show that these, these are really needed services if people are, are really interested in how, how can we get this in, into homes. But what about these older adults? And this will be our last question for today, Sarah. Thanks so much for your time. But these older adults who maybe really don't feel like they want any help right now, um, and maybe their family thinks that they really do need something like capable to come in and, and help, um, help them reach some goals. Is there a place for capable in uh, a situation where the individual themselves is not necessarily seeking this type of assistance? So um, I think that the family can talk to the older adult about um, what they what they want out of life, you know, and that's a great conversation to have with any with anyone, right? What do you want? Carry out out of life. It, it, people like talking about themselves, and like to think about that. And a conversation that's not pushy, um, but that is curious about someone can often lead to someone wanting to make change. The other answer to that is that the um, Medicare pays for something called the annual wellness visit. Um, and activities of daily living that we've been talking about are on that visit screen. And so a doctor or a nurse practitioner may be screening someone in a way that would work well for capable. And they could say, I think you could benefit from this based on the fact that you have difficulty bathing and dressing, for example. Um, and um, yeah, so I would say there's kind of a medical way and also families um, can have really amazing conversations with older adults about what they would like to be able to do. And then you could gently make the point that you might be able to do this or that if you could, if you had less trouble with some of these other daily things. That's an amazing way to end. The lesson we probably can all take into our families and into our homes is to get curious about our older adults and what they want as they continue to age. Um, and to have that conversation, because Sarah, I think you're right. This is something your team does amazingly well. <laughs> it's to start with that conversation and, um, you know, to, to give people that independence and respect that dignity to, to make those goals and then uh, to help them achieve them. Amazing. And can I, if I could say one more thing about that. Just if anyone's actually looking for advice for having that conversation, I would start with, um, tell me about your typical day and let them walk through their day and then say, is that how you would like it to be? And what else would you like to do? 
That is a great starter. Now we, now we know what to do, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today, for sharing your program and the work of your amazing team. And next Wednesday, we'll be taking, talking with Drs. Melissa Walls and Victoria O'Keefe about their initiatives, con connecting youth with their families, including some of the elders in their indigenous communities across the country for the goal of improving health outcomes and resilience. Our conversation will also include their children's book written and published during the COVID-19 pandemic that helps to build resilience among youth and children. And it was tweeted by Chelsea Clinton. So we'll go to the other end of the age spectrum um, next week, but also tie back to that um, community and older adults in those communities as well. So join us next week for a look at the work of Drs. Melissa Walls and Victoria O'Keefe. Sarah, thank you for being with us today. It's been my deep pleasure, thank you. And thanks for tuning in. We will see you next week. Be well and bye for now. <laughs>